Hello, everyone. Great to be with you on this Friday afternoon, kicking off your weekend with us. We appreciate it. I'm Misa Jeffries. I'm Assistant Curator at CAM, and today I'm joined by Tim Portlock, who's one of the winners of the Great Rivers Biennial. For today's program, Tim is going to give a brief artist talk, and then we'll open it up to questions from you all. Please use the Q&A function to send in your questions or thoughts. And actually, following the Q&A, we'll be presenting a video of a workshop that my colleague Jose Garza led in January. It's called Drawing from Observation. In it, Jose gives a really accessible and informational presentation about perspective drawing, and he uses Tim's artworks as examples. I personally learned a lot from it, so if you'd like to stick around after Tim's talk, we welcome you to participate in the drawing activity. So before I um, have Tim do his artist talk, I just wanted to do a little introduction. So Tim is a professor and chair of undergraduate studies at Sam Fox School at Washington University. He was a 2019 Regional Arts Commission Fellow and a 2011 11 recipient of a Pew Fellowship in the Arts. Tim has exhibited his work at the Akron Museum of Art, the Institute of Contemporary Art Philadelphia, Pulse Art Fair in New York, Broadstone Studios in Dublin, and the Tate Modern as a member of the artist collective Vox Populi. Tim was recently selected for the State of the Art 2020 exhibition at Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art in Bentonville, Arkansas. And you may also remember that Tim presented his video work 11th Street City Symphony MP4 as part of Street Views in the exhibition Urban Planning, which was at CAM in 2017. You might also have seen his work at a St. Louis art venue such as Monaco, Dot Zach, Granite City Art and Design District, or the former Fort Gondo. His work is currently on view at the Courier Museum of Art in a traveling show called Open World Video Games and Contemporary Art. So with that, I will turn it over to you, Tim, and just wanted to say thank you so much for being here with us today. Well, thank you for that really lovely introduction. Thank you for having me and <clears throat> thank you for everyone for uh, coming. Um, it's great that we're all still able to see art, even though we can't be there in person. Um, so I'm gonna talk about my work chronologically because I think it helps to sort of provide a context of what's at the museum. And then it also helps to understand like how my ideas have evolved over time. So I'm just going to share my presentation. So this is one of the very first works that I made in, in the kind of work that I've been doing for the last roughly 10 or 12 years. Um, I uh, relocated to Philadelphia and was um, struck by the large number of empty buildings that existed in Philadelphia at the time, which roughly numbered 40,000. Um, and I wanted to make work that foregrounded those aspects of the city at the time. Um, at this work that you're seeing here is actually made uh, using visual effects software, which is a um, tool that's used in the visual effects and computer game industry. Um, I'll, these are some of the buildings that were in, um, the, in Philadelphia near my house at the time. Uh, oftentimes I would, uh, or all the time, every time I would photograph them to use as reference imagery um, so that I could uh, more accurately recreate um, the buildings in my uh, software. Uh, here's another example of some of the buildings that ended up in my work. And here's a wireframe uh, image of the art image that I started out with. And the reason why I have it here is so you can see clearly that it's not a photograph, but rather um, a 3D virtual version of, of a facsimile of a city. So here's a, so for the first sort of series of works I made using this process, um, I based it on Philadelphia, which is a post-industrial city. And um, I, uh, one of the things I was interested in is creating a city that, a, a virtual version of the city that focused exclusively on the empty and abandoned buildings. Um, and so what that entailed was I actually uh, did not recreate the occupied part or the uh, inhabited part of the city. And um, I only focused on the uninhabited parts of the city. So this series of work was actually called Ghost City. 
because my contention is there was a ghost city that resided in the inhabited version of Philadelphia. So the, one of the other important uh, parts of my work is it's really influenced by the tradition of 19th century American landscape painting. Um, so one of the important things to me about uh, that work is that it was created by artists who uh, were, were born when there was no America and then in their adult lives, they uh, were Americans. And uh, during this period, most major Western countries or I should say large Western countries had its own particular landscape tradition that was put that was created to articulate a, um, a sense of national identity that was particular to that country. So, um, you know, there was a German landscape tradition that was meant to articulate sort of, you know, what it meant to be a German citizen. Uh, the English had theirs, the French, every, et cetera. Um, and so the being that they were the first group of Americans, they were very self-conscious of things that they wanted to articulate through the American landscape tradition. And so I actually had always been really amused by that, like a bunch of people sort of sitting around and having discussions about like, well, what, is, what does this mean to be an American and how do we visually articulate this? Like, so not only did they have to think about the identity part, but they had to come up with a vocabulary for articulating it. And so um, this, these uh, sort of visual conventions are how I think about uh, uh, composing sort of contemporary subject matter because I'm really interested in contrasting sort of the values embedded in those 19th century landscape painting traditions with the contemporary reality of life uh, in, 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 in cities, in American cities. Um, so the, I have this image because I uh, strictly base it on a specific painting by Thomas Cole. Um, and in this painting by Thomas Cole, I think sort of the uh, standard interpretation is that it articulates his anxiety about um, the industrialization of the American landscape, right? It's like on the right side, you have uh, the landscape that has been tamed and turned into productive farmland. And then on the left side, you have the oncoming destruction that enables that um, industrialization. And then in my uh, painting, I actually reverse that. And uh, the, the image is meant to articulate a sense of anxiety at deindustrialization of the American landscape and uh, anxiety about <laughs> the wilderness taking over the city. Um, so here's more images from that series. Uh, this was, uh, this series of images roughly coincided with the 2008 economic collapse. So a lot of the discussion that was going on around the time about cities being dead and what to do with the remains of the cities that existed, you know, Detroit uh, was, 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 people were concerned about it just no longer existing as a city. Those kinds of discussions was informing this work. Um, another thing that I was thinking about was, uh, you know, 19th century American landscape painting is like among other things is a, a also a colonial genre of painting. So if you like look at uh, Australian or New Zealand landscape painting, oftentimes the, one of the things that these paintings show is the flora and fauna that's uh, specific to that region. And so I kind of took that as a cue to talk about things that you would, that I saw at that time during the 2008 collapse. So this is the flora and fauna of post-industrial part of, of Philadelphia. So after that, I did a series of work about Las Vegas, which uh, was the home foreclosure capital for several years. Um, there's a couple of reasons uh, in addition to that why I selected Las Vegas as like the subject of an, an another body of work. Uh, one of the things is that it was, it's been the subject of art theorists for a while. And I think they focus specifically on Las Vegas as a site of spectacle and image. Um, and I think the thing about, uh, you know, the era 
that we call 2008 is um, I, I wanted to think about Las Vegas as like a place where you have actual visceral physical experiences where you like people go to work and you know have a job and own a house. Um, and uh, so this, this uh, series of images uh, is based on a lot, a lot of the images are based on the empty and abandoned and foreclosed homes that I identified in the city at the time. Um, so for example, this image, this previous image is actually uh, not, doesn't have foreclosed homes, it has a golf course, but one of the things in the foreground or some of the things in the foreground actually refer to the refuse and garbage and labor that uh, goes into maintaining what to me seems strangely like an oasis in the desert. Like I, one of the things that struck me about Las Vegas is how there are all these golf courses that were green in the middle of a place that was very, needed to be very conservative with water. Um, this is a historic uh, a hotel that was uh, torn down. Um, there's a long story about how uh, Tony Shea, the founder of Zappos, uh, tried to convert Las Vegas. Like, so again, like another solution to turn a city around at the time for Las Vegas, Tony Shea wanted to uh, turn uh, Las Vegas into like the a desert version of Silicon Valley, but he also wanted to combine sort of like coffee culture of Manhattan, um, which kind of seems absurd. Um, but, and, and he eventually gave up after spending a lot of his fortune. Um, but he, one, of the, one of the things that came out of that was tearing down this historic motel, which was in um, old uh, Las Vegas. Uh, so uh, sort of the tail end of me making that work and doing research for that work, I would spend, I would spend a lot of time in, La well, uh, I, would, I would make regular trips to Las Vegas to do research. Oftentimes I would go visit relatives in Las, Ve or in Los Angeles and drive to Las Vegas and I'd go through this town called San Bernardino, which became the home foreclosure after capital after Las Vegas. And so I made this body of work about that. Um, there's, there's more images, but I'm, I'm trying to be succinct in 20 minutes. Um, so, I, you know, each body of work has like six to 10 images. Um, and this, this series of images, I was invited to make, um, uh, I, was, I was invited to participate in a show in Camden, New Jersey. Uh, and the, the theme of the, sh the exhibition was work about Camden, New Jersey. And, um, you know, before this, I, I mean, well, I've, one of the things that I've always been trying to figure out with my work is like me as an outsider visiting a city can, is, is full of like a lot of pitfalls, like problematic issues, right? Like I'm, I don't live there. I'm going there and making uh, judgments and distinctions that I'm articulating through my imagery. And I, I try to, I, think about different ways that I can um, be true to what's, what's going on in the city and also not be exploitive of, of the communities that are, are there. Um, and so like, I, I first started to think about like developing a formal process for being as ethical as possible with making this work with when I went to Las Vegas. So I um, would meet with a, a, a journalist for the local public radio affiliate um, when I was in Camden, I, I tried to meet people on the street because like that's what I learned from like street photography is to try and engage people in conversation. But eventually I, I met up with the local uh, photo department at Cal State San Bernardino and um, people who had lived there for 20 and 30 years actually um, uh, worked with me and showed me around the city and, and engaged me in discussion. In Camden, I actually... Um, uh, a friend of mine who's an artist in Philadelphia introduced me to his mom, who was a public school teacher in the Camden school system for 30 years. And so I met a bunch of people who uh, I just had lunch with them and we had discussions about where I intentionally steered the conversation towards um, what, what, how do you imagine Camden would be in 20 years? Um, give me an anecdote that encapsulates your view of or your idea about what Camden is. And the idea was that 
in this conversation, they would be guiding how these images would evolve. But at the same time, I'm also interpreting um, their perceptions of where they live or where they've been through my own experiences with Camden. So I'm thinking of it as um, a give and take, right? So um, one of the big things that came up repeatedly in, in the conversations that I was having was white flight was a big, like a major sort of milestone in the sort of economic failure of the city. And so um, the images that I made about Camden in some way link up to uh, white flight, especially like a particular year when it got really bad in the late 80s. I think it was 92 actually. So these images came out of those discussions. You know, I have these boats on top of these rooftops um, as like, um, I have different titles for this image, um, but the, the one I <laughs> like the most is Escape because it's people uh, planning on leaving. And so I kind of think, one, uh, an analogy I think of is like Noah building the ark waiting for the flood to come. Um, and so this is obviously the current work. In, in case you haven't seen the show yet, you should go see it. Um, this is one of the images in, um, in, in, the, in CAM right now uh, for my Great Rivers Biennale exhibition. And actually, this is the first series of work that's not based on any specific city at all. It's actually based on all the cities that I, all the big cities that I visited in like maybe the last three or four years. And one of the things that happened um, recently is I started to think about what initially motivated me to make the work that I make, which is empty and abandoned buildings and this sort of anxiety that, uh, we, dread we used to have as a country, like so we'd watch the news and you know the home foreclosure crisis was happening and so we universally like seeing an empty house was uh, the sign of like decline, you know, social decline. And I think now when we, when we see an empty house, like depending on who you are, like that looks like an opportunity, right? So some, like something has changed in those like 10 or 12 years. And so it, you know, sort of uh, uh, motivated me to reevaluate what I was thinking about and, and, and articulating through the work. So in the work that I have in the show at CAM, it's a combination of construction sites, like new, new buildings and older buildings being torn down. Um, and I think there's like a lot of additional things that I think about with, with with those uh, features. It's, um, uh, I think about architecture as a sort of social model, like, uh, you know, each building and what is unique to it is sort of imagining um, how people live and work and interact with other people. And so I've, I've been thinking about um, what it means to tear down a building at its proposed uh, one kind of social model. And then, you know, uh, new buildings proposing something that's kind of an alternative model. Um, so that, that's like sort of another layer to the work that I've been making lately. So let's see if I have another image. So here's just more work in case you haven't seen the show. Um, you know, uh, so, so there's buildings from different cities. And so like, um, and then there's buildings that are just completely made up. So the building on the right I was, I had a radio interview like a week and a half ago and I had like my, like I'm getting senior moments. I couldn't remember the name of that building, but it's, it's a building that's located in uh, the Northern part of St. Louis. It's called the Lewis and Clark Tower. Um, and then behind that is a construct, a building that's under construction that I photographed when I was in Los Angeles and I reconstructed it. Also the building here on the left is from East St. Louis. Um, and I scanned those, I made those with uh, drone scans. Like I, I used a drone to photograph some of them. Some of these I made in my modeling software. And then some of these model, some of the objects in this image I actually purchased. So for example, there's a crane back here. I didn't, there are actual marketplaces where you can buy 3D models. And so it's a conglomeration of all of those kinds of um, crafted things more work from the show. So the, the building in the background, it's kind of a controversial building from uh, 
lower Manhattan. It's actually considered a park. Um, and then there's a lot of a debate over where, whether or not it's a structure intentionally meant for um, wealthy people or, or, or who, who is this public space really meant for? Is it truly um, public sort of uh, thing? And then here's an image from the exhibition just to give you guys a sense of the scale. All right, and that's, that's the conclusion of my presentation. That was great. Thank you so much, Tim. Um, I wanna open it up to questions from the audience. If anyone has any questions, just shoot them into the Q&A. In the meantime, I always have questions for you, Tim. Um, I, I'm curious about your use of buildings that exist versus buildings that are made up or that are purchased through a marketplace. Like in looking at those buildings like the Lewis and Clark Tower and, um, and the one that's in East St. Louis, you know, they're, they're falling apart. You know, they had an intention, it didn't work out. And I see what you're saying about it being like a space of opportunity maybe, or, you know, you could see a kind of optimism in some way there, but there is the kind of like the other side of it is sort of like ruin porn and like, you know, kind of picturing places that actually exist out in the world. I don't, I'd just be curious to hear you talk about that because um, yeah. yeah, there's two sides to it, I think. So, uh, so I think around the time I was making work, like I think people were most like a lot of people were artists were going to like Detroit and photographing, you know, uh, old factories and, you know, empty this and, you know, buildings that have collapsed and all that stuff. And uh, I think the, the, the question is, is like, is what does, what is this work doing? Like, is it, is it actually uh, informing people of anything or uh, motivating people to take some kind of action or is it just simply there for like aesthetic pleasure? Um, and so I, I definitely like I consciously do don't do things because I'm trying to avoid that. Um, so for instance, like I don't have people in my work because I don't want to uh, show people. Uh, I think that's like too immediate to not be exploitive, at least for the kind of work that I do. Um, and then the other thing I think about is um, so definitely like ruin porn the term like I think that's a real thing at this on the other end of the scale though I do think it's important to show things that are not uh working working well because I don't think people will do anything I, I, I like I think about like what other forms can we articulate <laughs> that things are are not right you know and it's like sometimes you have to show them visually it's not like you can treat it in a conceptual way. Um, and then also I try and engage people in conversation. I think, you know, with the building in East St. Louis and the, the Lewis and Clark Tower, I'm always, like, I, I think what I'm doing is placing them in a broader context, you know, like um, I'm showing that this building is coexisting with a building that's being constructed. So like one is happening at the expense of the other. Um, so that, yeah, that's my answer. I, could, I, could, no, I think, I think about this stuff a lot. So that's why I can continue yeah. to ramble on about it. No, no, I think that's great. I think, I think because you work in computer gaming software too, like there is a certain like remove from it. Like it yeah. looks like something you know, but maybe you don't. Like I think a lot of people wouldn't necessarily recognize the Lewis and Clark tower, but I think it's a really interesting kind of teachable moment. I think there's a lot of layers to exactly what you're describing. Um, we've gotten several questions and comments. Um, the first one from Francesco, he says um, to you, Tim, do you ever use any paint or markers on any of your work? So make actual physical marks. I, I don't. Um, I do some color correction in Photoshop once the image has been uh, rendered out from my software, but you know, I don't, I don't make any marks. Although I, one thing I didn't see in my uh, talk, I, I was probably a little bit too concise because I was worried about time, but my, most of my formal training is as a painter. So I actually have a two college degrees in painting. Um, 
So yeah, I, I, I think about, I, I come out of tradition of mark making. So it's kind of strange that I actually don't physically make them anymore. I do sketches for my work sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, someone else actually asked a kind of similar question about um, wondering if they might have misunderstood um, if some of those earlier works were paintings versus photo manipulations. So I think you kind of addressed that. Um, another question here. So the Philadelphia series contains telephone poles that appear to be crucifixes, especially in the image with the hill, um, Golgotha in parentheses. Do you acknowledge a spiritual aspect in your work? I don't know what Golgotha is. So you might have to. So, so that's where, that was where uh, the hill where Jesus was crucified on. Okay. Um, I, you know, I think that's, I, I like the fact that people can read that into the image, but, but I honestly, I wasn't thinking that at the time. Um, I, I showed the work in, uh, I showed the work somewhere in, a, in an exhibition and someone pointed that out to me. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think that that's, I mean, it's kind of like a cool connection to make because I feel like those are the kinds of references that you see in the kinds of paintings that I kind of model my own work on. Like there are, there are religious reference, a lot of religious references in 19th century American landscape painting. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, speaking of Noah's Ark and everything like that too. Um, we've got another one. Um, your show and your work gave me a connection with my son who's a serious gamer. This is coming from Mel. He said, um, he explained things to me too. So thank you. And um, his son is wondering if you're a gamer and do games influence you visually or just technically? So uh, yes, I do play games. And so here's another thing I didn't say in my talk. So, you know, after, <laughs> after uh, I, I did go through a period where I, I wanted to make them and um, uh, I was really interested in how uh, around the early late 90s early 2000s I started to think of games as like extremely innovative sort of storytelling as a very innovative storytelling medium and it seemed like there was like I could see that there was um, the vocabulary for storytelling was evolving right in front of me and I wanted to participate in that and even if I didn't, you know, get a job doing that stuff, I wanted to incorporate um, some of those things into my work. And, and actually, I went back to school. So the, the period, so I have the degree, to, like a graduate degree in painting. And then I, I painted like as a muralist and as a, you know, artist to make paintings for um, art galleries for 10 years. And then I actually went back to school to learn how to make digital art. And so for several years, I was actually, I was working on virtual reality display systems. Um, this was in the early 2000s. And all of those skills that um, you learn to make virtual reality, it's like pretty much the same skills you use to make 3D computer games. So like it was really easy for me to transition into that. And so for like maybe two or three years, um, I was making art with computer games. Um, that was, you know, uh, uh, the intermediate point to how I got to the, the work that I, I make now. Great. Um, another question here, do you have a favorite or least favorite building in St. Louis or a building that you want to include in a future work? Anything that's inspiring you now? Wow, that's a, wow, that's a good question. Um, so there's actually a building by CAM that looks like Mount Olympus from a distance. I, I, I am, I am, fascinated by that um i can't remember oh I, the masonic temple yes. like the former i think it's a former masonic temple it's massive i mean it's like yeah. you can see it from miles away it yeah, looks I like it's well. yeah you know, it looks like a temple on a mountain but it, you know it's not yeah, yeah. <laughs> um i'm trying to think of, i mean there's a lot of you know uh i really like the brick elaborate brick architecture of st louis so i think and it's very distinctive from other cities Mm -hmm. um, I can't think of like any particular city, but if I had like a number two or three building, it'd probably be something that had like really cool <laughs> brickwork. Yeah, that's a great answer. Um, another question here. Can you talk about the graffiti marks in your work? Do you think of them as communicating in code? 
Like, are they telling some kind of message or talk about the reason why you include some of that graffiti on the buildings? Well, I mean, I think, I think graffiti is uh, oftentimes like people use graf or graffiti is more common in places where um, things are in decline because just simply because there's less like permission uh, required. So, um, I mean, from my, from my experience as a muralist, like I don't, I worked a lot with people who did graffiti, like a lot of graffiti people, like sort of moonlight as muralists. Um, and like where, where you have permission is like a big issue or do you care about permission is another issue. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's why you see graffiti in places that are uh, uninhabited is because people don't have to think about those issues. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I'm not really thinking about it as like, um, a communication system, even though I know that it is a communication system. Um, I'm thinking of it more as a marker of like decline. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I mean, but there's plenty of examples of murals that are not a sign of decline. Like there's murals, you know, uh, graffiti murals in like the middle of Paris that are funded, you know. <laughs> right. Okay, another question from Charles. Is your work a landscape in the way they would collate a Roman ruin with the sky and hill, et cetera. Often these were fictional, but had the elements that people want. Maybe it's a cult, maybe he meant collage. Um, and shepherds and a few people, if so, you left off people like Eastman is famous for. Okay, I'm trying to, did you get that, Tim? I, I think so. So, uh, so the thing about American landscape painting is it's like oftentimes, not every time, but oftentimes it's usually based on a real place. Mm -hmm. uh, so like that painting I showed you is based on a specific river called, and a part of a specific river called the Oxbow. And, um, and, 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 and that's the same thing with my work, right? So, but the thing that is similar between that work and my work is there's also a lot of creative license taken to uh, infuse the image and to make it seem like, make it seem as if these sort of like uh, notions of Americanness are embedded in the actual landscape as if it was like a natural, like Americanness was naturally a part of the landscape. Uh, but if you go to these places, like there are like interesting differences, right? So you can, you, you will see that uh, the artist took license. So, and then the other thing is, um, I think there's things that like, you know, English landscape tradition, German, uh, Italian, all that, all of it's like Western tradition. So, I mean, on some level there is like, you know, some things that are shared. I mean, just like the notion of like landscape, you know, uh, there is like a Asian sort of a, a landscape tradition that's like, you know, has another set of concerns to it. But I would say like Western landscape tradition like shares a lot of stuff, but I, I do try to pick up on like what's particular to um, the American sort of iteration of that. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we have two more questions. Um, the next one, Andrea is saying, I'm curious if you also see your work as a collage. So talk about your relationship to collage and if that exists and any um, connection to surrealist landscapes as well? Not so. Uh, that's an interesting question. So not not consciously related to surrealist landscape. Um, I will say collage in the sense that, you know, paintings can be a form of collage where you're being very selective about what details to combine from like uh, experience to kind of, you know, communicate what the essence of that experience is. Like, I, I think, you know, collage, like the idea of collage is very tricky, right? I mean, like there's obvious forms of collage where you're like cutting up paper and putting it together, but then there's like collaging experiences or sensations or ideas and sort of making them seem like either a unified whole or a collection of fragments. And for me, I'm, I think I'm, I'm trying to do both at the same time, like letting the viewer know, like these are parts that I'm putting together, that I'm being very selective about what details I'm choosing to show you. 
but that I'm trying to communicate something in the process. So another way, another way that I've been talking about this stuff lately is like, I, I think of what I do as sort of like a lazy form of data visualization. Like I'm just using really characteristic elements from, you know, something to say like, there's a lot of this thing in the world and um, hopefully I'm increasing your awareness by presenting it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that. Okay, the last um, comment and followed by question from Eddie. He says, I'm thinking of the very near future with so many companies realizing they don't need their buildings because workers have proved themselves to be productive from home. So these more recently built structures may be emptying very quickly. So what might the future cityscape actually be? Yeah, that's, I don't, that's a good question. I, I, I can't really say, I, I, I have been thinking a little bit about that, like that, you know, we, people will not be coming back to their office space. Mm -hmm. Although I am, re, I am re, reminded of, the, of people saying the same thing in 2009. Uh, like, you know, it was going to be the end of business class and, you know, yeah, no one needed to work at home or no work, go to an office anymore. Um, I, I kind of think it will turn around eventually. Um, I do think that uh, these arguments are also very cyclical. And I think people who run offices or, or whatever kind of work that we think can be done at home, like at some point, there will be a cycle of like, I want to see people do work. I want to make sure that they're being efficient, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, it may take a while. Like I'm reading stuff today, like that the economy won't get back to where it was for a very long time. So, Well, hopefully it'll get there. Yes. Need to end on a slightly negative note, but I think I think it is a cycle. It'll probably <laughs> turn around eventually. Um, so I just want to say thank you so much, Tim, for sharing with us today, and um, you know, talking about your earlier work and all the way up until the present. It's been really um, fascinating to learn about your process and how you've gotten to be where you are. And I want to thank everybody also for being here today. And um, if you want to stick around for the workshop, the drawing from observation workshop, we're going to play that next. Oh, and I did want to just say that if you haven't seen Tim's show at CAM, it's closing really soon. I'm actually shocked. It closes in two weeks. So um, hop online and make a reservation uh, to come and visit us soon. And until then, hope everyone takes care. And again, thanks so much, Tim. Well, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. It's been fun. So Michelle, let's go ahead and start that video whenever you're ready. Thank you, everyone. So drawing from observation has been adapted for virtual delivery of health and safety concerns due to COVID-19. Typically we would be meeting in the gallery, we would be looking at an exhibition and then we would be talking about, about a particular drawing format and technique and using it as a reference. But since we are meeting virtually, we're gonna take this as an opportunity to do things a little bit differently, maybe experiment a little bit. If anything, we are going to take it as an opportunity to engage with our interest in drawing and then expand on its possibilities. So this program will feature an exhibition spotlight still. I'm going to introduce a drawing technique and then we'll have a special guest that will talk about the technique that I will be referencing and then how it relates to what they do. So this season's drawing from observation will spotlight Great Rivers Banyo artist Tim Portlock and his current exhibition, Nickels from Heaven. And we'll use it in relationship to the drawing technique of perspective. So why do we want to use drawing to learn about artwork? So there's a couple of reasons. One, it is connected to the history of art. But one of the things that I love about drawing as a teaching tool is that it's portable, right? You can literally just carry the materials with you in your hand. Sometimes we have them with, with us at all times. It's immediate. A lot of times you can start drawing something and see, see results pretty quickly. And the other thing that I really like about it, it's that it's very accessible. So 
if you want to get started uh, drawing, all you need is a sheet of paper, a pencil, or a pen. And then why the emphasis on observation? So some, you know, for this, it might be a little bit obvious, but it's good to reiterate the reason why. But for artists, understanding the nature of the physical and natural world is fundamental to drawing, but also to art making. So if you understand how light reflects off the surfaces, if you understand, you know, how color can be affected by uh, distance, et cetera, it helps you kind of render things more accurately uh, through artwork, if that's, if that's the intent. Also, uh, drawing requires a close examination of the nuance of surface and the contours of form. So I like to think that when you look at something closely, you get to know it better and you understand it better. And I feel like drawing really gives us access to that. Third, I feel like that every time that I draw, I am engaged in observation. So I'm looking at something, I'm recording it, you know, so I'm drawing it, even if it's a doodle or if it's something more realistic that I'm spending a little bit more time on. And then maybe I am taking time to reflect and interpret what I'm doing. So we're going we're gonna to use some of that today. The technique that we're going to be talking about is perspective. So drawing is full of fundamental techniques that will improve how you create art. If you like or want to draw realistically, understanding these methods is extremely useful. So perspective is a tool that will help, under, help us understand how to render space accurately on a two-dimensional plane. And that's the other thing that's really incredible to me about uh, drawing is that you know, on a two-dimensional plane, on a, on a plain sheet of paper, we can imagine a landscape, maybe a cityscape, and by using some lines, we can render that accurately. So perspective drawing gives objects on a two-dimensional surface, like a sheet of paper, a sense of three-dimensionality, like it's coming off the paper. There are two types of personal. We're going to be talking about linear perspective. So there's an example on the image on the left, of course, and then atmospheric. In Tim Porlock's uh, work, he actually uses a combination of the two. We'll start with a couple of basics. So when we talk about one, two, or even three-point perspective, we're talking about linear perspective. And this is a method of representing space in which the scale of an object diminishes as the distance from the viewer increases. If it's further away, it starts to disappear. So essentially, objects that are further away from us appear smaller than those that are near. And then the position at which they meet at the horizon line or the intersection of where the ground meets the sky is called the vanishing point. In order for us to identify the different kinds of perspective that are maybe used in different works of art, the vanishing point is key to that and kind of locating where that's at. A good example of one point perspective is to imagine that you're looking down a railroad. All of the elements of the composition, particularly the track itself, would converge at a single point on the horizon line. In this illustration, it is towards the tunnel. A one point perspective can be at any point along the horizon line right, so where the, where the sky meets the edge of the, the land, and uh, not only the center. So the only requirement is that all lines lead to a single point. Although this may seem like a basic approach, it is evident in iconic works of art, and we're going to look at an example. And just to reiterate, this particular example, the vanishing point is in the horizon or in the center, right, but it's like in one perspective, you can kind of move it up and down up, or side to side on that horizon. So the Adoration of the Magi from 1481 by the great Leonardo da Vinci is a, a great example of the use of one-point perspective. So this incredible drawing demonstrates the great lengths that the artist went through to determine the focal point of the piece. And then I'm going to show you the image in a second, but it's like, I want you to please notice how the lines from the steps in the arches all converge at the same spot on the horizon line. So as we look at this drawing, the really wonderful thing about this is that I love that it has a lot, a lot of reference lines in it. A lot of times, you know, especially when I'm teaching um, drawing to younger audiences, uh, younger artists or art appreciators, you know, we're really obsessed with the eraser and, you know, making it look really great. But I love that a lot of times, you know, when we leave marks that show measuring or adjustment. It really kind of really informs the composition and, and like, leaves a really, really great insight into the process. So here, this is not a complete complete artwork, I guess, <laughs> but we are using it as an example. And it's like a very beautiful one too, very informative one where we can try to figure out where the, the convergent point is. So here, uh, maybe you already located it. And if, if you haven't, or you're still having trouble, I'm just gonna give us a little help locating it right there. This one is like a little off center on the composition. So just as one point perspective uses one vanishing point, two point perspective requires two, right? So these two points are usually at opposite sides of the composition. 
So such as one on the far left and then one on the far right. Instead of things going towards the center, uh, you have things kind of receding towards those two points or getting smaller as they go towards point one and two. Three-point perspective, it's also called multi-point perspective, has more than two vanishing points. So this is common, especially as the complexity of the subject matter grows. So a standard set of features, two vanishing points on the far left and far right of the composition, and then a third point uh, below or above them. So in doing this, you get a bird's eye view or what's called like an insect view. See if you can identify where maybe the horizon is, where the uh, point of uh, a vanishing point is on the horizon. And then maybe we can identify the other points that are below or above the horizon. So I'm going to give you a moment to just kind of look at this image uh, titled Beach View by Tim Portluck from 2015. We'll do a reveal. Some of you probably already found it or <laughs> you're still working on it. I can just, I can kind of show you. This dotted line is basically showing us where the horizon is. So a lot of times like the horizon is like very self-explanatory. We're very familiar with with that term. For the first vanishing point, we're going to look for it at the horizon. It seems like it's behind the billboard. You know, I think where I have the point there pretty accurate, you know, might, we could probably like nudge it over one way or the other. And then you probably notice that it, you know, the, the other points are not above the horizon. Like if the points were above the horizon, we'd be we would be looking up at the composition, right? So almost like we're looking up at a building. So here, the clue that the other points are below the horizon line, of course, is that you kind of see the tops of the buildings, right? So you have a bird's eye view and you're looking down. So the uh, things are converging out, almost outward out of the frame at the bottom. If you can see it there at the far left, I put a, a point, far uh, right, there's a point. These points are probably more accurately depicted if they were outside of the picture frame because they kind of keep continuing. Uh, past that point, which is, gives you a really nice sense of scale, kind of where the, uh, the image is like is the illusion that it's expanding beyond what we can see. But that's just like a good reference there. But again, the way that we can identify these points is by some of the markers, like looking at the tops of buildings or looking up at a building, let you know whether the uh, other points are below or above the horizon line. Linear perspective is based on mathematics. But atmospheric perspective relies on something different. This is also called aerial perspective, and it conveys depth through the va value changes, colors, and visual clarity. This image, also by Tim Potluck, helps illustrate atmospheric perspective. So the details, is, the details closest to us, usually at the bottom of the composition or the paper, are in sharper focus and are... The details closest to us on the bottom of the composition appear in sharper focus and are usually darker. And then as the scene recedes away toward the top, the landscape becomes brighter and softer. And another really great example of Tim Porlock using uh, atmosphere perspective is this work uh, titled Sunrise from 2011. On the on our CAM website, the Drawing from Observation event page, we put together some worksheets where you can practice one point and two point perspective. So these are PDFs, you can download them. It'll get you started. Hopefully easy to follow instructions, just a couple of steps showing you kind of how to get started and you can kind of build upon the instructions and make the compo composition your own. Materials for these two activities are uh, hopefully pretty easy to come by. There are paper, a pencil or pen, eraser, and a ruler. If you don't have a ruler, sometimes if I misplace mine, sometimes I use another straight edge like a book, or if I have a piece of cardboard, something straight and rigid really helps. And then there's a couple of tips there that you can kind of follow, kind of help you along. So there's, yeah, so we have a, a worksheet for one point perspective and two per point perspective. With those worksheets, you can experiment on your own. You could always, you know, come to the museum. Uh, you can look at Tim's work. Uh, you can also look at the building itself. Uh, one of the great things that I love about museums is typically they do allow you to draw in the museum. The reasoning for the for drawing from observation is that we can kind of talk about something and then do a little bit of drawing and or sketching in, in the galleries. Yeah, thank you for joining us for drawing from observation. Just wanted to remind you that the museum does have COVID. We have uh, we do have steps in place to keep you safe during your visit. We have time visits, so you can go to the museum website to schedule a visit. Also, some of the images that I use, I found in Tim Porlock's website. So also a lot of other great work, a lot of really awesome work that we have here at part of the Great Rivers Banyal and his exhibition, Nichols from Heaven. But you can also visit uh, Tim Porlock at his website listed here. 
And then one of the tools that I use as an avid uh, fan of drawing, a practitioner of drawing, is that there's a, an organization called the Circle Line Art School. Maybe some of you are familiar with it. And they have really great tutorials online. It's always great to get together with people and draw, but during these times where that's not uh, quite such a good idea, uh, you can always find other folks making uh, Circle Line Art School has some great tutorials on two three-point perspective. I highly recommend them. For our upcoming exhibition, we will have another Drawing from Observation program. I can't guarantee that it's not going to be virtual, but thank you for joining us for this experiment. Stay safe, and hopefully we see you for our next program. Thank you for joining us again.